Good afternoon. Good to see some friendly faces in the audience. Thank you for being with us. Uh, welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies on behalf of CSIS, as well as the Foundation for Defense of Democracy, Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance. Welcome to this conversation on Vatican financial reform with Dr. Renee Brillhart. Um, in all transparency and openness, uh, it should be known I'm very close friends with Renee, although I'll be a tough questioner and uh, I've tried to be a tough board member uh, in, in terms of the Financial Information Authority at the Vatican. Um, with uh, Dr. Brulhart is also Dr. Uh, Tommaso de Ruza, who is the director of the AIF. Uh, they're here um, meeting with government officials and regulators uh, and others in the private sector to talk through the financial reforms underway at the Vatican and in the Holy See. Um, and so we're very privileged to have Rene with us, um, privileged to count him as a friend, and really to have a discussion about what's really happening uh, inside the Vatican, uh, a discussion that's often filled with much mystery and secrecy, uh, filled with lots of lore and legend, uh, and often not a discussion that's filled with much fact or um, what I would consider to be rather pedestrian and mundane elements of what a reform agenda looks like in the context of uh, financial reform. Um, but I think this is an important discussion because in some ways what's happening in the Vatican is not just emblematic of reforms in the Holy See, but also what's happening globally in terms of the anti-money laundering, counter uh, illicit finance regimes, uh, a quest for transparency, accountability, higher global standards, higher accountability in the financial sector, all of which is impacting uh, the expectations as well as the work at the Vatican. And so we're privileged to have uh, Rene here to talk through uh, what those reforms look like. Uh, just so you all know, this is being live streamed, uh, so you have to be on your best behavior. Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll have a discussion up here for about half an hour. Uh, this whole discussion is set for an hour, so we'll open it up uh, to questions. We will have microphones, that way others who aren't with us can hear what the questions are. Uh, and when that time comes, I'll ask you to identify yourself and ask a question, of course. Uh, so again, welcome very much, uh, and, and uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Renee, talk to us a little bit about what you walked into at the Vatican, because you were asked in many ways initially to serve as advisor then director of this new financial information authority or, or reformed body, uh, and then now as its president. Uh, can you talk to us and explain to us what you walked into, uh, especially given your experience in having been really one of the renowned turnaround artists in the anti-money laundering space, um, having helped Liechtenstein get out from under the cloud of uh, suspicion and taint um, and having helped to build the financial intelligence unit for Liechtenstein. What did you walk into when you walked into the Vatican, uh, and did it meet your expectations? First of all, thank you very much, uh, Juan, for uh, um, these very warm words, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and many thanks to CSIS um, for hosting this, um, this event. Now, um, talking about expectations, um, it's maybe the wrong word, you know? so it's a, it was more really kind of uh, finding something you potentially you can't imagine because it's, it's a wonderful world there, but it's a different world. And, and I think that's something when you kind of tasked, and I was tasked with this work um, starting in September 2012, um, first as, as advisor and then talking operational role and now stepping back from the operational role and looking into it um, more from a non-executive function. Um, there are very, many, many rumors out there, many, many gossips, and I think we really here have kind of to distinguish on what is kind of the, the outside view and especially then also what internally really is. So if you go back to kind of 2012, what happened that time was that accounts were blocked um, of the IOR, so of the Institute for Religious Work, um, mainly in Italy, um, all of a sudden, by the end of the year, um, when tourists wanted to kind of pay their entrance fee to the museum, the credit cards didn't work anymore. Um, the president of the IOR, um, in a way or another, also was not there anymore. The same also with the director and with the deputy director. Um, so it was all kind of a 
quite a heat linked also or also combined with a lot kind of, let's say, media work and media heat there too. So that was kind of the outside, um, the outside situation. Internally, it looked quite different, or not to say completely different. And internally, I think there was a, a very strong kind of, let's say, political support and willingness, A, to understand really what happened, but also then how can we turn around that? You know? So how can we address it in the best way possible? How could that happen? So, and I think that was really kind of the, the very first question in a way or another I was confronted with. And, and a lot of this, and you've spoken about this, started under Pope Benedict. Uh, Pope Benedict That's correct. began to sort of deal with some of this. How, how did that take shape and, and what steps was he taking and, and how does that play into what you're doing now? Well, I think the kind of the, the, the really, let's say the, the formal starting point was with the motto proprio of 30th of December 2010. It's like an executive order. Yeah, kind of a clear, strong sign yes. to do something. <laughs> um, or a clear expression of will. So it's, uh, and I think there were mainly kind of two issues linked there. One was the setup uh, or the establishment um, of AIF, so of the authority I'm chairing today. Um, and second was the uh, introduction of the first um, anti-money laundering law in the Vatican, that time so-called, the law number 127. So these were really kind of the first uh, formal steps to be taken to directly address um, the issues I was mentioning before. Rene, um, maybe for the audience that may not understand sort of the Vatican structures well enough and where you sit and what the AIF does, could you give uh, kind of just a thumbnail sketch of, of the structures and in particular with Cardinal Pell and his role, um, how does this all fit? Can you give us kind of a, a mental picture of the architecture? Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, uh, I try to keep it simple, so because it's kind of, a, it's, it's, it's rather complex, but to keep it simple is, to, if you look at the Vatican, so it's, you have mainly, until some, um, a bit more than a year ago, you had mainly for, let's say, all the organizational administrative issues, you had the Secretary of State being in charge. And now with a part of the reform, um, especially on financial matters, but not on regulatory matters, but on financial matters, the so-called Secretary for the Economy under um, uh, Cardinal Pell has been introduced. So it's mainly kind of taking control over the financial administrative side of the Vatican as such. Completely apart from that, really, on the anti-money laundering world, and especially also on the regulatory side, um, as I said earlier, with this motto proprio of 30th of December 2010, um, AIF has been established as an operationally autonomous body taking care of these kind of issues. So first, kind of as a so-called financial intelligence unit. So this is kind of the institution which receives um, so-called suspicious transaction reports, analyzes it, and then forwards it to, um, to law enforcement in a way or another. But then what we did in the court of 2013, um, we set up not only this kind of FIU, but also we set up a full-fledged regulator and supervisory body. So under the umbrella of AIF today, we have kind of two key pillars, one as financial intelligence unit and one um, as supervisor and regulator for the Holy See. And I think it's well worth to mention that because sometimes there are certain kind of misunderstandings. Um, the beautiful country which surrounds the Vatican called Italy um, has no jurisdiction over the Vatican. So also law enforcement authorities, the prosecutors, the tribunal, these are all um, Vatican um, or Holy See institution as such. And the same is with, the, is with AIF. If you look into the structure of AIF, um, and I think that's kind of interesting, they're um, completely independent from the Secretariat of State and from the Secretariat for the Economy on operational matters. Um, we have a board with some lovely members, like <laughs> Zarati, 
um, and then we have the directorate. So the board is exclusively responsible for the strategic matters. Um, these are all non-executive members. And then we have um, the director who is present here today, Dr. Tommaso Di Ruzza, um, but really, again, in full operational autonomy. Now, you describe the autonomy of AIF, which is fairly unique in the Vatican structure um, and the role of the Vatican city-state, you know, surrounded by the Italian uh, polity. Um, but it's not immune from external pressure. I mean, what you described in terms of the situation you walked into was uh, enormous external pressure, suspicion about the Vatican, uh, considered a high-risk jurisdiction uh, with banks beginning to close accounts, freeze accounts, et cetera. Um, can you talk through the external both demands and pressures uh, that the Vatican is under, both from Italy, but also European standards and expectations, and where this sits globally? I mean, in many ways, you've been a part of the global system uh, to drive uh, the anti-money laundering system. How does the Vatican sit in that context, given the fact that the Vatican is so unique? In fact, I mean, when we started to do, you know, to do our work, so kind of for the first months, at least to, to the outside visibility, it seemed that we haven't done anything, but we have done a lot internally, mainly kind of to understand um, from where this pressure is coming. You know? so it's a, and this is justified. You know? so, and when we talk about kind of the pressure, so who are the players? So are these authorities? Are these the media? Um, are these kind of individuals with certain single interest? Um, you know, it's a religious uh, organization. There are other issues which play a role in there. Um, also some kind of, let's say, political issues. So it was really kind of to, to get a proper understanding, um, uh, you know, what are kind of the threats out there, no? So what are the vulnerabilities? And in a way, kind of what went wrong? And then on the basis of that, we could start to address these kind of issues and to get a proper understanding how to handle um, with that. So for sure, and to be a little bit more concrete, um, for sure the media play quite a key role. Um, for sure also, let's say, um, authorities or certain authorities, maybe also with their own interests, um, play kind of a key role. But I think here the critical element um, comes into the game. So why do you want to go into this kind of transformation? So do you want to go into that because it's such a high pressure? Because you think that you have to do it because you know, the others are telling you that? Or is it much more, do you realize that you want to do the right thing because you have a completely different responsibility, especially speaking about the Holy See? And especially also speaking, let's say, about a moral uh, responsibility. And I think that was kind of an internal process which we, we started to address. And when I say we, then it's not, even if I'm sitting here today, uh, it's not me, it, there are many people involved, it's a team. Um, that's really kind of bringing this process forward and ultimately really standing up and saying, we do it for us. You know? We really do it because we want and we, want, we have to protect the Holy See as such. And that's why we want to take these measures. And then on the basis of that, you can start to come up in tailoring a system which has to be functional and almost uh, and as important as that, it has to be sustainable at the end of the day. So that's really kind of the development. And I think the, we could have done a fantastic job in, in, in a few weeks with a lot of window dressing, you know, so it's uh, talking to the newspapers, going in, in TV shows or whatever, and telling everybody what we're going to do. But you haven't chosen that approach. It would be maybe much easier, but most probably not sustainable, or quite sure not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So we tried to go the sustainable way in the sense that also starting to speak to the media, or when we gave the very first kind of press conference in, in mid-2013, talking about facts, talking about what have we done, and especially also how, how we're doing it, yeah. so how we continue, and really speaking about facts. Well, let's get into those facts and, and talk through sort of your plan as you assess the landscape, the external pressure, the internal pressure and challenges. What steps were taken and, in your mind, what metrics are good examples of the kinds of reforms that are underway? 
First step, and it was really kind of a step-by-step -step approach, um, the first step was really um, to change the legal framework. Um, I'm not saying that kind of the, the first legal framework um, per se was deficient. Um, to a certain extent, yes, but it was mainly not really kind of addressing the, uh, let's say, the risks and vulnerabilities the Vatican is facing. So it was really about setting up uh, a new legal framework um, as such, and especially in a very telemate uh, matter. This we did um, with the so-called new law number 18, which has been, which has entered into force um, in October 2013. So once we hopefully <laughs> got that right, um, or to certain extent also kind of parallel, because in the law itself, we as an authority also obtained much more power uh, got different instruments um, in addressing the issues, made it very transparent internally, but also to the external world, changing the institutional framework. So really kind of establishing the authority with the necessary competencies, also from a good governance point of view, to be in a position to execute its mandate. And then, as a third step, international cooperation. So not only talking about cooperation, but acting. So, and there, becoming member to the Egmont Group in 2013, which is kind of the, the worldwide, uh, worldwide umbrella organization of financial intelligence units. I think nowadays there's something like more than 150 members in there. Um, and then also bilateral, um, bilateral agreements. So with players here in the US, with uh, FinCEN, with the OCC we have present here today, um, uh, with European countries, with Italy, with Germany, with France, with UK, with Australia. Um, really and these are information sharing agreements. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Really kind of building a network that allows, an international network that allows us to, if necessary, to, um, you know, to share information, to cooperate together, and then once you have this kind of, let's say, three pillars to make the thing, the whole thing operational. So give you some figures on that. Um, we had till, um, till kind of November or, or till October 2012, we had one single suspicious activity report. No? By end of 2006, uh, 2012, we had six. By end of 2013, we had 202. And by end of 2014, we had 147 suspicious activity reports. No? So there, the system really works now. It's functional. International cooperation. So 2011, 12, not even a handful. Um, 2013, in more than 80 cases, we cooperated with other competent authorities. In 2014, in more than 110 cases. So it's, it's really developing a system as such. Now, is today everything perfect and great? Most probably not. But I think the approach we are following, and especially also the system we have set in place, um, is functioning. Rene, have you had to close accounts um, internally, uh, other changes that have had to take place? And you mentioned sort of building the legal structure around the risks that are attendant to the Vatican financial uh, system, you know, what are those risks? Uh, how would you classify those? I mean, one of the risks we, we strongly faced, and this is also linked to, let's say, what you would call kind of to the account closure, um, and you can go a little bit into, figure, into the figures uh, in a second, was really to get an understanding who has access to financial activities um, in the Vatican. And I think that was one of the vulnerabilities Quite a bit of, uh, for quite a while, so that it was not really kind of ultimately clear, and I'm not saying that there was a huge abuse or whatever, but at least how it was set up, it was not really kind of absolutely clear who really had access to client relationships, etc. And that was really something where we went into the whole kind of verification process um, to get the proper, you know, proper CDD measures, etc., putting that in place to really mitigate potential abuse risks. That's one issue. Uh, another issue, the use of cash. You know? So if you look into the statistics, so 
in the last years, um, cash has tremendously, or the use of cash has uh, tremendously decreased in the Vatican, but still. So having cash, cash transactions or whatever, different measures are necessary. So meaning that you have to have a much better profile, um, client's profile, that you can mirror if the cash you bring in, that the cash you take out, makes sense in regard to this client relationship. So if you just have a name, but you have any kind of background information on that, it's almost impossible to properly mirror um, the use of cash. So this just has kind of two examples how to do that. Now on the kind of account closure, and I assume that uh, you have massively seen that also in the, in the media, um, we in, in the kind of in the last few years, um, something like more than 4.5 thousand accounts um, have been kind of closed or blocked. Uh, quite a big amount of them were somehow dormant account, but some of them uh, were also not really kind of really in line, let's say, um, with the mission of the Institute for Religious Work. And I think that is one of the issues where we really go back to the roots. So what the Institute really stands for, and that is to serve the Holy Church. And from that point of view, I think um, the measures which have been introduced um, were absolutely appropriate. And the institute you're talking about is IOR, commonly referred to as the Vatican Bank. <laughs> Just again, for, for folks who may not be familiar, can you explain what the Vatican Bank or EOR does and doesn't do, uh, or, or does and doesn't do, uh, does and does not do now? Uh, but well, I hope I know what it does and what it doesn't do. So it's, uh, but I hope you do too. <laughs> so it's, uh, I mean, yeah, we call it, we call it mainly kind of a financial institution, sui generis, and not really a bank, because kind of the, the activities um, it carries out, which are mainly kind of type of payment services, um, providing kind of credit card business, so to, to, to a very limited extent, type of kind of retail banking um, or retail business uh, and some kind of asset management, but there are no loans or not lo no loans anymore. There are no mortgages, etc. So it's not really kind of a bank. It's more, more like a fund or a type of family office you, you have there. It's also not kind of possible uh, if you would like kind of to walk into the Vatican and you would like to open kind of a client relationship, um, it just doesn't work. So you can't do that. So it's not kind of, let's say, a player on the commercial on the commercial market, but it's really kind of a financial institution um, for um, uh, serving kind of the Holy Church as such. So it's a, so it's a, it's service-wise, but also access-wise, it's it's very very much limited as such. And does it hold assets like artwork or real estate or holdings like that? Now you're starting to ask tricky questions. So <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's mainly, it's, it's, it's really mainly as a financial institution um, without this type kind of, 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 of investments or whatever. So we don't have um, an investment banking sector, right. um, hopefully not. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it's really kind of direct treatment of the, uh, of the customers as such. Um, Renee, you've touched on this already, but I think one of the interesting um, dimensions of, of the work that you're undertaking and, and of this topic is just how unique the Vatican is as an institution in terms of its reach. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uniqueness of the institution itself? You've touched on it from a legal perspective and a jurisdictional perspective, but also culturally, religiously, in terms of its global reach, and how that m matches or mirrors or maybe is even is in conflict with the principles of transparency and accountability that are the hallmark of the global anti-money laundering system. Uh, I, I was only there to allow to myself to speak about that really in, in regard to, let's say, to financial activities the, 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 the Holy See carries out. You know? So it's, a, I think, keep in mind the, the Holy See is a global institution and has also kind of a global responsibility and is, um, uh, is active um, all over the world and especially um, all over there um, where there's a lot of kind of pain and where there's also kind of need for help. So, and especially 
um, you and your former kind of uh, role at Treasury, mainly kind of uh, doing a lot on sanctions or whatever. So mainly also active in, in, in countries which are sanctioned, you know, but you have poor people there, um, you have uh, clerics there, they also need help and support. And so it's really kind of, um, it's not kind of a commercial role there. So it's really kind of a role to help and to help to facilitate that people there uh, are going to find the help, that they're going to get access to, um, to money at the, end of, uh, at the end of the day. So you, you speaking, for example, about Africa or parts of Asia, there are no banking systems there. No? So you don't, you don't, you're not going every morning to the ATM machine and you're withdrawing cash or whatever. So it's a, or you go somewhere to a bank counter and you withdraw money or you're going to go with your check or whatever. So, so you have to find a way that you can also ensure that in these parts of the world, where mainly also the poor parts, that you can facilitate certain financial services in a way or another. So I think the task there and the responsibility is a completely different one. And unfortunately, um, and often media, they only talk about the negative things. You know? So only about the scandals or something is happening or is pumping up. But all kind of, let's say, the good work which is done out there and how it's, it's facilitated and how it's helped um, uh, this is not really kind of mentioned. Now, having said that, for sure, this is also causing tremendous challenges. You know? So it's, uh, and we are here in DC, um, talk about sanctions. Um, we have seen the news this morning on Iran. Um, let's see what kind of impact this is gonna have on the sanctions regime as such. But still, there's another world. There's a human world also out there. And sometimes this, when we talk about, let's say, kind of AML CFT measures, this human world is sometimes getting forgotten, and especially also the measures to combat uh, money laundering and terrorism financing is sometimes, unfortunately, also combating humanity. Feeding off of that, I, I think an interesting point that you've made and just uh, alluded to is the moral responsibility of uh, the anti-money laundering system, uh, both within the Vatican and globally. Can you speak to this question and this issue of global standards and um, the standards that you would like to see the Vatican sort of employ for itself and, and be a part of, uh, because there's a lot of talk uh, as you look at the reforms, and especially with those major banks that have been hit with major fines or sanctions or even criminal prosecution, uh, a quest for the highest global standards. Um, is that sort of the quest you're on at the Vatican? What, what, what are you hoping to achieve and what's your message externally and internally? I think the highest standard for us ultimately is a moral standard. You know? So it's a, you can have now, we have whatever, just to give you an example, the new or not that new 40 recommendations again, so it's a, so, or whatever, you take Basel three, et cetera. So you have all kind of the, the frameworks which are given and they, they show you the direction and they somehow kind of indicate, let's say, the type of the, the formalistic standard as such. Is that enough? Most probably not, at least uh, not to me, because the question there is how are you going to implement that? And, and I think here we have kind of the, uh, the divergency somehow, do you do it because you have to do it? Or do you do it because you want to do it? And I think when you do it because you want to do it, you're going to go on, a, on another kind of moral level as such. And here, you know, taking, for example, or taking the Vatican, you don't have kind of responsibility, or partially responsibility, or you don't have responsibility really to stakeholders, to regulators, or to a certain extent, or whatever, or to whatever, so to, to your kind of rating agencies or whatever. But you have a responsibility to 1.2 billion Catholics out there. And I think that is something that is pushing you um, and this is also kind of helping and supporting you in doing this kind of work um, and hopefully kind of bring it into the right direction on a different level. You know? so it's a, and again, going back to your question, I think one of the key issues is really kind of the implementation. You know? so it's a, and I think in the international world now with the risk assessment and all that, I think it's going into, into the right direction. But I mean, each jurisdiction in a way or another uh, has its own kind of own 
threats, vulnerabilities, risks, etc. And I think there, there's still quite some room for improvement and also in the financial institutions, you know, so it's a, um, that you really start to do the things and maybe sometimes stop a little bit, look back and say, okay, where are you standing? Why are we doing these kind of things? How can we protect ourselves? And just looking, you know, every quarter in the next figures and we have to increase the earnings or whatever, where's the sustainability? You know? So it's a, we're also kind of, to a certain extent, the moral values and sometimes also giving back something to the society as such. So, and I think maybe now with all kind of the crisis and especially also looking into Europe or whatever, I think it's a perfect example also with Greece. Um, where are we standing? You know? Why are we doing that? And how are we doing? So sometimes it's also good to stop a little bit, looking back, reflecting, and then hopefully taking the right decisions. Let me take the prerogative of one more question and then we can open it up. Um, there's a lot of interest in the Pope and the Pope's role in pushing reform across the board. Uh, what's Pope Francis's role uh, in all this? Um, and what's your relationship with him? Let, let's keep uh, internal issues internal. Okay. And uh, the, uh, what is fair to say is, um, as you said earlier on, um, Pope Benedict started the process. And uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that uh, Pope Francis, the Holy Father, um, is strongly supporting transparency and is also, in that regard, also strongly supporting transformation. You just have to look into, into the facts as such. So it's a, um, if you look back the last um, bit more than two and a half years, the, the development and especially also the progress we have done um, wouldn't have been possible without kind of a strong uh, political support um, starting with the Holy Father, um, but also, especially also with the Secretary of State. Um, the Secretary for the Economy came later into the game. So there is internally a strong support um, in bringing this uh, these reforms forward, bringing this kind of transformation forward, um, but really under one clear condition. And I think that's what you're standing for, um, to help the Holy See and ultimately to protect the Holy See for any kind of illicit um, behavior or abusive behavior uh, in financial matters. Great. Great. Let's open it up now for questions, as, as promised. Raise your hand, and we'll have uh, a, an attendant <coughs> with a mic come to you. Um, this uh, woman here in the center, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I have two questions. You said it's a fund. Who regulates your fund? Is it, or is it a self-regulatory fund? The next question is, are you bringing in money from outside countries? And if so, who monitors the traffic of your money from outside countries in and your, the Vatican to other countries? Thank you. The, thank you for the question. The, the IOR, so the Institute for Religious Works, is a financial institution. You know? So I was saying it's, it has to a certain extent um, certain, um, certain indicates or parameters of a fund or whatever, but let's call it a financial institution as such. So who is regulating it? My authority. So AIF has been set up as a supervisor and regulator within the Vatican to supervise and regulate um, financial institutions therefore also the, um, the IOR. Um, reply to your first question. To, regarding the second question, yes, you have, um, uh, so money is coming in, in cash, as I said, um, is, is, is brought as in other, any other kind of jurisdiction um, to the Vatican and is also leaving the Vatican. So what is happening, any kind of transaction over 10,000 euro has to be reported and ultimately the reports are going to us. So there we have full control um, over the movements of the cash. Yes, Mr. Gentleman. If you could identify yourself, please, thank you. Phil Bozelli. Could you clarify or elaborate on how the Vatican Bank makes money? I assume it's not a charity. I know they give out money, but how do they really make their money in the context we all understand here in the States? 
as many other financial institutions. No? So it's, you, you have a part on the, so you, you have kind of uh, the different issues. Part is, is kind of fees from your, from your customers. A part is um, on, uh, on investments on, on the assets. And a part is, is really kind of to, uh, in the framework of the asset management as such. So it's a, where it's also kind of investing its own asset. So it's it's a kind of very ordinary way as such how this is done. So it's a, so in that regard, it goes a little bit kind of uh, really as a fund to a certain extent, some type of banking issues, but but it's mainly kind of um, these elements which I just mentioned. Yes, sir. Pedro Borelli. Um, could you explain, in terms of the new structure of the Secretary for Economic Affairs, how that has brought in not just the fund, let's say the, you know, the, the money management, but also the asset, physical asset management of the Vatican? And at what point you know, do you sit there in the discussion and view uh, the money that's actually liquid and that you're tracking, whether it comes in and goes out in the right way, and the assets that exist and whether they are you know, held in the right way, where they're valued in the right way, where they're reflecting the true economic value of those assets, and who has them? Who, who has, uh, who has the ability to enjoy uh, the perks of a fantastic apartment? Uh, you know, in the, in the Via de Consolazione and stuff like that. I mean, there's a little bit of the whole management of the entire asset base, which I assume from your title, it goes beyond the Vatican Bank to the entire uh, financial assets and, and well-being of the, of the Vatican? Um, you have mentioned kind of the, the fiscal side, just to clarify that at the beginning. So there is no real tax system in the Vatican. So it's a, but don't try to apply to become kind of, um, uh, to, to get domiciled in the Vatican. So <laughs> this is not going to be difficult. That, that's going to be slightly difficult on that. Um, talking about the secretariat, um, for the for the economy, so um, as you can imagine, kind of the the Vatican as the oldest institution in the world has also kind of grown in a way which has not always been in the let's say in the most kind of streamlined uh, way as such, or in the always in the kind of in the most transparent way. A lot makes a lot of sense, um, but there are some also some kind of peculiarities. So let me try to give you a picture. So what is kind of currently going on? Um, so if you have kind of a, a family enterprise, so a family company, so you, so you have the father, he's running a successful um, uh, business, and then you have kind of, you know, the son, he's going to do something slightly different, but he's opening up his own company, uh, the daughter, second daughter, third daughter. So, so you really have kind of a... a conglomerate of, 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 um, of family businesses going on. Now, if kind of the father with his, um, with his son and with his kind of three daughters, daughters is sitting on a table and saying, let's go for an IPO. You know? Let's go and bring it, um, to, uh, bring it public. Um, then most probably, let's say, the accounting standards um, are not sufficient. You know? And that's what is more or less more at the moment. So uh, don't worry, we're not going to bring the Holy See um, to the stock exchange. So <laughs> we're not going to bring the Vatican public. But that's a little bit kind of what is happening at the moment. So it's mainly really kind of trying to, to identify internally also the type of accounting mechanisms, the internal transparency on these kind of issues, and then having, in a way, another kind of um, uh, a consolidated accounting system in place based on clear standards and guidelines. And that's mainly kind of the work of the, uh, of the Secretariat for the Economy in that regard. So when you see sometimes in the news that we have found this and uh, this millions or, or here or whatever, so it's really kind of a process and it's not really kind of finding, I mean, this, this, these assets have been there, you no? Know? So it's just more how you evaluate it in a, in, in a, maybe in a different way and how to bring that all together. But that's mainly kind of what the Secretary for the Economy is currently focusing on. Um, this gentleman here, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Yaya Fenusi, Foundation for Defense of Democracies. 
Um, question, uh, you explained how unique this experience has been, and, and of course it's, it's clear it's a very unique uh, jurisdiction, uh, but if you were to go back to uh, Liechtenstein or any other FIU, could you describe what practically would you bring back uh, from this experience in terms of lessons learned uh, that could translate into another jurisdiction? I think the, the institution as such is definitely unique, but maybe how it has been done is maybe less unique or less exciting and more boring than you can expect. So it's a, but I think the, the lessons learned, or let's say kind of the type of methodology, it's, it's really maybe at the very, really first to get an understanding what we are talking about, you know? as, as simple and stupid as it sounds, but really, who are the players? You no, know? so it's a, what are the threats? What are the risks? The vulnerabilities? So it's a, what are kind of the different factors which do play a role in that kind of environment? And then really, once having identified that, coming up in introducing a tailor-made system. And I think it's sometimes everybody wants to be the first one, and it's 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 also kind of a lot, especially in that field. And uh, I don't know, maybe you see that different one. But it's quite a bit of copy and paste, no? So you take a system, you take a methodology, it fits everywhere. No, no, it's, it's just different, no? So, and once you, you really look into that in a clear way, so you know what the standards are, no? They're on paper, no? So it's a, but maybe you don't know exactly what the mentalities are, no? So what the motivations behind where, no? What the story behind is. And I think sometimes not enough respect is given um, to the history or how things have been developed. And when you want to build something sustainable, I think it's well worth to take a little bit of time to look into that and really kind of facing yourself, especially also with the mentality there. This gentleman in the back. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Britt Minchel, Renaissance Institute. Uh, this is really kind of a layman's question, uh, so forgive me. I'm used to praying for people, not for, you know, looking into financial affairs. My question is, and I'm trying to picture it, when you look at the Vatican Bank, obviously it's not a retail bank like Bank of America. It's a closely held institution inside the Vatican. Do you act as the general bank for all the Catholic Church? Um, and it, do you hold all the assets under your hand, your investments under your hand. That, I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, I'm very glad that, you, that, you, that you're asking that. So, uh, no, I mean, it's, look, kind of the assets on the management of the, of the IOR are something like six billion um, euro. So every small Swiss regional bank is, is larger. So what do you have? really in, in the, with the IOR in the Vatican, so there is no obligation or whatever. So if you have kind of a diocese somewhere in, in, in Asia or, or here in the US or whatever, um, that you have so-called to bring the money back home or whatever. So, it's a, so there's sometimes kind of a misunderstanding that the Vatican has full control over everything what is happening in the world and then need to a certain extent also held responsible for that. But definitely for kind of for, for financial matters, um, there's a lot of kind of freedom there um, what, with what kind of bank you want to work here in the US or, or in Switzerland or, or in Singapore or whatever. So it's a, um, that is not the case. However, what we are kind of trying to focusing on is especially um, you know, the type of standards, especially um, uh, you know, on transparency, but also kind of what should apply internally that this almost becomes kind of a global standard for, um, let's say, for religious organizations on that. But that's going to be a long way. So that includes Catholic universities, charities, hospitals, dioceses, yeah. sort of that, the full panoply of Catholic institutions. What you're saying is it's not all collectivized. That's correct, yeah. So it's not all kind of under the control of, of, of the Vatican. That is sometimes really getting misunderstood. So it's, that's not the case. Father, and then this gentleman here. Two questions up front, please. I teach at Catholic University in relation to politics, but 
I am a priest of the Archdiocese of Washington, and sometimes we refer to the Archbishop as a corporation soul. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there very definitely uh, you know, is a di distinction. But moving over to Europe, I was wondering, does the, the, the bank and, and your particular role in it in um, overseeing, um, well, uh, problems, have any particular connection with Brussels or Berlin or, or the bank in, in Frankfurt? The, thank you, Father. The, keep in mind that the Vatican entered into a so-called monetary agreement in 09-10 um, with the European Union. So, which means that the Vatican has as official legal tender the euro based on this convention. And in that regard, um, the Vatican committed fully to implement um, AML, CFT, so anti-money laundering, combating financing of terrorism standards of the European Union. So currently the third EU directive, um, soon the fourth EU directive. In addition to that, what, um, what the Vatican did was uh, unilaterally kind of requesting um, to apply uh, relevant and applicable parts of the EU financial regulations, which we mainly implemented with regulation number one. So as a strong commitment, especially also on the supervisory side, um, to be in line with the European standards. So this is really something where that's kind of the closest link uh, we have there. But we are not kind of linked, or the, or the IOR is not linked to the European Central Bank in a way or another, except via the currency as such. Sir. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, you touched on the agreement with Iran, which was announced um, today, and uh, the details are publicly available. Um, there is a timetable within it for lifting of financial sanctions, the range of financial sanctions, US, EU, and, and others. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how, as those sanctions get lifted, the business of your bank will change. Will there be more financial transactions, more accounts opened, or do you see any other changes taking place? Thank you. Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, I'm Jonathan Brewer. I work uh, at the UN. I'm a member of the uh, UN panel on Iran. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, glad that you could make it to come over. It's always good to see you. Um, it, frankly speaking, I would be very, very much surprised if um, the events of this morning would have directly or indirectly um, on the financial side, any, um, any impact on, uh, on the Vatican. This young lady. Hi, um, Porter McConnell from the Financial Transparency Coalition. You mentioned the European Union Anti-Money Laundering Directive, and I guess I'm curious to know, in the spirit of um, the moral obligation argument, I'm curious to know whether you uh, will be implementing um, and maybe it's your colleagues, uh, a public registry of beneficial owners, or whether you will sort of be meeting the letter of the law. Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit kind of, let's say, the, at least from a formal point of view, the music of the future with, with the fourth EU directive. So it's a, um, the system we have chosen so far um, is mainly kind of on the internally within kind of the, the, the financial institution or the financial institutions as such to have kind of full disclosure, but more important um, from our side as kind of supervisor to have full access on all the relevant information and which is granted and which, um, which is given. Now regarding, the, regarding a potential register, um, we will have to see how this is going to, uh, how this is going to develop also um, in the future. But again, keep in mind the, uh, the uniqueness of the, I'm sorry to use the word, but of the business model or of the clientele we have in the Vatican as such. This is not kind of a commercial bank. This is not, um, you know, kind of 
uh, a financial institution um, which is in competition um, with others in the world or whatever. So it's really kind of um, most of the or, or very many of uh, the customers or that they're involved in uh, or have a kind of client relay or customer relationship with the, with the IOR um, have in a way another almost an institutional um, function or are even clerics or whatever. And here you also have to be a little bit kind of careful, as I said earlier on, um, you know, when you have kind of clerics being active, priests or whatever being active in, um, in countries which, uh, which are dangerous, you know, so which are maybe not kind of very friendly to this religion. Um, now, if you're going to have a full transparency, you can also put people's life in danger. So there is always kind of a balancing act on, uh, on these kind of issues. And uh, I think we, we will look into that very, very closely and very attentively. And for those who aren't following the fourth EU directive uh, so closely, or the beneficial ownership rules, there's a, a major sort of debate both in the EU and even in the US around uh, registry of beneficial ownership of corporate vehicles and entities and what form that takes. And, and uh, to what degree uh, that should be public. And so that's, that's an ongoing debate. And in fact, there's a proposed rule here in the US that has not yet been finalized regarding uh, beneficial ownership. So this is a, a really important issue. I'm glad you raised it. Other questions? Uh, this gentleman in the back here. We've got about five more minutes. Uh, Dante Figueroa from the Library of Congress. In the performance of your duties, particularly in the, in, while conducting your investigation, where did you draw the line between crime and sin, given the uniqueness of it? <laughs> <laughs> and whether <laughs> the criteria you used has been met with some level of resistance in, in, from inside. Thank you. Good. Thank Could you. I pass the first question to the father here? So, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yeah. we're yeah. going to open a confessional uh, next door, Father. <laughs> I, I, I'm just a humble servant, so I would never dare start you to talk about saints, no. So, and therefore also about kind of confession. So, it's uh, um, no. I mean, it's kind of let's say uh, being in the financial world. I think kind of the criteria out there uh, are quite clear um, uh, on the conduct. Um, which is kind of carried out. Slightly different element is um, once you're going to sanction this kind of uh, conduct in a way or another, and the question then there is also who, let's say, has committed certain, um, um, uh, committed, I'm not talking about crimes, but maybe certain type of offenses or whatever, and they're definitely kind of the, the catalog of sanctions in the Vatican is slightly different than, for example, the OCC has. So, uh, <laughs> so there you can apply also different, um, or potentially a different flexibility. Um, that is one issue. Um, on the, what was your second question? Sorry for that. Uh, where you met on the oh, okay. Um, look, wherever you have kind of, let's say, changes or whatever, so for sure not everybody's happy. No? So, and I think, we are here really in, in, in a field which, um, which is almost kind of a contradiction. You know? So to have the Vatican, the church, and you know, talking about money laundering, corruption, things. Uh, so this is almost kind of a clash of, of these two worlds, if I may say so. So I think one of the key issues there was really to have a very extensive internal communication. Why are we doing that? How are we doing it? No? And as I said a few times this afternoon, ultimately really to protect the Holy See as such. Um, and I think that is one element. And the other element is then when you go in changes, um, I think also building bridges. No? So it's uh, also you know, really kind of being almost kind of a mediator and bringing kind of the different, let's say, forces together and get the best out of it together. So this is not about, about me. This is not about other individuals. This is about the Holy See as a whole. And I think we are here to serve, not more and not less. Sir, in the front. Uh, 
<clears throat> Hi, I'm Paul Cadario from the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you mentioned European law and the EU directives that you subscribe to, but earlier you alluded to the Holy See's uh, higher purpose and indeed higher authority. What keeps you awake at night? What, excuse me? What, what keeps you awake at night in your role? Um, I'm sleeping very well, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, not enough because it's too much traveling. So it's, uh, but um, uh, yeah, I got a little bit old. That's true. So it's, uh, but uh, no, I mean it's. I think it's a responsibility at the end of the day, and having this kind of two elements. You no, know, so what you mentioned on the on the European, you know, kind of it's not only European, let's say, um, uh, legislation, but it's you know, kind of. FATCA, stand, FATCA uh, sorry, FATF standards, etc. So all kind of international standards which do play a role. But I think it's more, this to me is more kind of, these are the building blocks, you no? Know? So this is really kind of, which gives the direction. But the question then is, and here we go a little bit more into, into the moral side, is how you're doing it, you no? Know? So how, how you're doing it, who you involve, how you involve the people, and especially then also how you kind of turn it into the hopefully proper results as such. And I think the approach here we are following is, is a very proactive one. So it's really a preventive one. You know? And you know, kind of the, you have a lot, this kind of discussion, and especially here in the US, so it's a, I think the, the kind of the sanctions of financial institution has become quite massive also when you look into the figures, et cetera. And I think, what my vision is really kind of building something together. You know? So you have a regulator, you have a financial institution, but ultimately you sit in the same boat. You know? And I think we all want to have a clean, uh, we want to have clean financial activities. We don't want to do kind of dirty stuff or whatever. So let's do it together. We have to be fully aware of the different roles, what the regulator has, what the financial institution has, but sometimes together goes better than against each other um, as such. One last question. Sir. Hi, Richard Greco, Phil and Jerry Capital Partners. Um, this is sort of a follow-up question onto the comparable analysis and some of the other micro-states in Europe that exist, Andorra, Monaco, Liechtenstein, uh, San Marino. As there's a push for greater transparency and of course anti-money um, laundering, anti-terrorism, et cetera, a lot of these countries have over the last decades really thrived on these sort of bad systems and have almost become dependent on them for their economies. How, as you're implementing um, a push towards transparency, global standards, how do you balance the sovereignty and sort of the right to have an economy, I guess, um, and the push towards global standards, is there room for these small microstates to survive? Okay, I'm glad that you didn't mention the Vatican, no, because it definitely doesn't fit into exactly. this kind of, <laughs> into this microstate, so it's, a, um, I, I think it's the, uh, and just speaking a little bit out of my experience in, 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 in doing Liechtenstein for, for some years. Um, tricky question. Um, I think the, the, the point there is really, what do you find in this kind of states? No? So what kind of, let's say, type of economy or whatever. So for example, when you talk about Licht or the principality of Liechtenstein, you only talk about the financial sector but the industrial sector is much larger than, than, the, than the financial sector. And it's also, you know, you might take kind of advantage of certain, of certain circumstances, but the perception then, and I'm not talking here about Liechtenstein, but in general, so it's and Andorra got lately got quite heavily hit, you know, so by, by FinCEN, for example. Um, I think one issue is really, let's say, that you have potentially few bad players that they really have an impact on, on the perception of the country or of the jurisdiction as such. And here we are back, um, which 
where I'm really kind of convinced is that as stronger kind of the regulator and the supervisor is, so as strong the, the authorities is, as stronger ultimately is also the financial center as such. And when you look back a little bit kind of, it was mainly when this kind of things happened was deficiency um, of the authorities. So either no authorities were in place or they didn't really kind of act in an accurate way or whatever that this kind of things happened. Um, but yes, it has kind of a financial, uh, or it can have kind of a financial impact. Um, but I think the rules of the game today, they have become so clear. And I think also the whole kind of, let's say, transparency movements as such, also with all kind of the mutual evaluation uh, reports, et cetera. Um, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be difficult in the, in, in the near future that that can continue, except that the same standards um, are not applied everywhere in the same way. And I think that is something mm -hmm. we are facing as really kind of, uh, when I say we, I'm not meaning the Vatican also, but uh, talking also a bit, uh, excuse me, for Juan also, it's uh, that kind of the, the regulatory frameworks today almost have become kind of a competition issue in the financial, in the financial world, mm -hmm. how they are kind of implemented how then they also kind of are, are gonna be evaluated. And I think here it's gonna be kind of really crucial that the same standards have to be kind of supervised and overviewed um, in the same way, yeah. which today is definitely not the case. Um, if you would reach that, then for sure such kind of jurisdiction will have um, to focus more and more on maybe on industrial advantages or in trade advantages because a part of the business as it has been kind of carried out in the past will not just not be possible anymore. Wow, a great hour, a great discussion, fascinating. Of course, we could go on uh, longer. Um, Rene Bruhart's a Swiss lawyer, a global anti-money laundering expert, president of the AIF uh, for the Vatican and a servant of the church, uh, and fortunately for me, a friend. So thank you, Renee. Join me in thanking Renee. Thank you.